was bad, then this is, this is gonna be gonna end up bad, but okay, let's see. So, um, quick spoiler alert, I will be talking extensively about a lot of movies in this presentation. So, all the movies here, if you haven't seen them, consider this your spoiler alert, because I'm just gonna give it once. A quick beat of drums, followed by backstabbing robberies, explosions, knives, cuffs, and a bus crashing into a bank as the clown prince of crime removes his mask and utters, twists the famous line, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stranger. What follows is a two hour and 30 minute epic crime thriller film about the Dark Knight, or in this case, Batman, that shocked audiences and critics alike when it was released in theaters in 2008. With a global gross, gross of more than $1 billion and a 94% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, along with eight Academy Award nominations, The Dark Knight is ranked as one of the greatest films of all time, and by, I think it was the Hollywood Critics Association as the second greatest superhero movie of all time, um, just after Superman. But what is it about Christopher, and this is just one of Christopher Nolan's many films, actually not that long of a film, it actually has a very short list, but in this list of less than 12 films, he has managed to shock audiences beyond belief. He has managed to top directors and movie makers who've made hundreds and maybe even thousands of movies by essentially having a unique way to embed philosophy into his movies. But he's, obviously he's not the only one, which is why I emphasize the word unique. What I mean by embedding philosophy into movies? Let's take a look at two other films that embed it in a way that we are most familiar with. Um, for those of you who haven't seen Google Hunting and Silence again, um, spoiler alert. So, for Google Hunting, it's about the story of a young man coming to terms with his own genius, and as well as a psychological trauma, in order to break those defense mechanisms down and to become his true self, to embrace who he really is. In Silence, the two priests down there, um, they learn about the complicated nature of faith and how sometimes what they're trying, how, how sometimes what the thing that they're bringing to save people can in fact destroy them. The way they embed philosophy into movies is extremely simple for Google Hunting. All you have to do is just to follow the plot. It's linear, you follow Will's journey, the supporting characters all root for him, and that's pretty much it. You see the end of the film. And for Silence, you can get the message easily because at the end there's literally a dialogue between these two priests that sums up the whole movie as a whole. Um, but when audiences left the theaters after 2011's inception, we don't feel like we have a clear grasp on what the movie's about. I mean, sure, we're stuck by the visuals and uh, the music and the, whole fight, and the hallway fight scene with Arthur and the Agent Smith guy, that was just amazing. I could watch that for just an entire night. Well, but we're not really, no, like what, we don't really know what Nolan is trying to tell us. And I think this is the first brilliance of Christopher Nolan. This is because of his originality. Now, what I mean by that? Let's take a look at another film that is visually stunning and extremely epic and has a huge global gross, but really, really not original and therefore really not unexceptional. 2012. Um, if you, here's the thing, if you take a look at this movie, again, this is a really long movie, it's like two hours and 30 minutes as well. It is nearly exactly a frame by frame reshot of the day after tomorrow, only with a bigger budget and the Himalaya Mountains. <laughs> Um, which is right there. So, but like, it's not original in any sense, and therefore, we can't really embed philosophy very well, but for Nolan, not for Christopher Nolan, everything in Inception is originally conceived. The, the thing about stealing ideas and dreams, the dream-inducing chemicals, the totems, the time dilation, limbo, everything is originally conceived. And the purpose this serves for Christopher Nolan is that he uses all this originality to shock audiences. And although many times we do not understand a Christopher Nolan film upon his first viewing, we are often attracted back to it for a second viewing. Not because we want to see the excellent visuals, although that is a perfectly acceptable excuse, but because we want to understand what he really wants us to know. Because his movies are so original, we don't get the message the first time. We are attracted to a second viewing, and thus he gets a greater platform to share his message. But it takes more than just originality. And, well, it takes me to another DiCaprio as well. And we have to admit it's DiCaprio after all. I mean, just look at that. I mean, how could you not watch some of his movies? But again, it takes more than just originality. It takes presentation. Presentation like the way actors are involved in the movie. Like DiCaprio. And that is none of, uh, no better illustrated than in Christopher Nolan's, I think, yeah. Um, next film, Interstellar. Again, huge, um, um, visually stunning, and the music of Hans Zimmer accompanying it is obviously epic. But again, and it's extremely original as well. In fact, it's the first movie to use black holes as a plot device. 
I mean, you don't hear that every day. He actually uses black holes to, com to complete character arcs, which is extremely unique. But again, it's not the visual, visually stunning things that, I don't even remember it, but that's not what distinguishes no one after all. We have many other movies that are visually stunning with space sequences. Man of Steel, the famous fight between Superman and Zod occurs in space, and in Gravity, which actually won an Academy Award for visual effects. All of these movies have spectacular visuals, but again, they don't really shine as much as a Christopher Nolan film. Why? Because of Nolan's presentation of his philosophical themes. He, his use of science fiction in his film to portray the, the theme that love has no bounds is incredible. Um, Black Holes is used, again, as I mentioned before, used in this movie, and throughout the course of the movie, really for our main character, Cooper, like, I'm guessing like I, at most like a few weeks happened, but for things on Earth, for his daughter, his separated daughter, is almost, is actually her entire lifetime. And at the beginning, Cooper does not the, the main the protagonist. He thinks that it's worth it that he is separated from his daughter because he wants to accomplish his goal. But at the end, you see, but at the end after the black hole and Cooper's ejected into a tesseract, he sees all of Murphy's life in one image. Of course, this is all like imagination, but he uses the science fiction element as a presentation, as a way for us to see Cooper's character arc. Cooper seeing all of Murphy's life regrets of how he could have spent his whole life, of, um, how, 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 he, how much of Murphy's life he missed. And he makes up for it by using the Tesseract to send a message and save the planet Earth, which in this movie is actually dying. So again, presentation, a use of science fiction, and obviously the excellent performances of Matthew McConaughey and Jessica Chastain, which didn't get nominated for Academy Awards, but whatever. <laughs> All right. But if you really ask me, besides originality and presentation, what is the one thing that makes Christopher Nolan so great, the, the unique aspect of his film, well, I think that can be illustrated in his magnus opus. I believe the greatest movie he has ever made, and in fact, I think, in my personal opinion, the greatest movie of all time, The Dark Knight. Now, I've mentioned this before at the beginning, but now I'm putting the Joker up there. So, this single last feature is focus. It just simply focus. Everything in this movie is designed to do one thing and one thing only to complete Batman's character arc and to allow him to realize the one theme that Christopher Nolan tries to teach us as the audiences, that justice is a very complicated thing. Um, unlike other superhero movies, like Man of Steel previously, where the movie's not only concerned with Superman's arc but also building the whole DC universe, the Dark Knight concerns itself only with how to build Batman's character. At the beginning, Batman is fixed. He is simple. He thinks justice is simple, and so do we, because we empathize with him. He thinks that all he has to do is to be criminals, and either they are so scared that they just give up, or they are not scared, and Batman just beats them, and beats them, and puts them in prison. So, but, and then, at 40 pages in, we're introduced to the Joker. The Joker's first challenge of Batman, as he kills somebody, dresses them dress up, dress up in Batman's costume, and basically challenges Batman to reveal himself. And throughout the whole of the movie, Batman will use, uh, I'm sorry, Joker will use several of these pressure points, including um, uh, creating clown hostages, uh, ex uh, loading the ferry with explosives, and many other things to call Batman to reveal himself and to change. Batman initially refuses, but eventually, as Joker turns Harvey Dent into Two-Face, kills Batman's um, uh, um, uh, love interest, Batman is forced to realize that it takes more than just beating criminals, and it takes more than just a linear notion of justice in order to truly defeat chaos, which is non-linear and completely uncontrollable. He realizes that justice is complicated, and even the subplot of the movie is designed to expose us. So, um, the famous scene where the two fairies are diverted, one fairy contains a shipload of prisoners, the other one, Gotham citizens. Both fairies are given the kill switch to the other. Whoever kills the other one, whoever kills the other fairies, you know, passengers first, gets to live. Um, the prison, you would think the prisoner, obviously, they want to kill the, kill the people on the other fairies so they can live, until one prisoner steps up, and he tells the warden that you do not know how to kill, so let me do it for you. He takes a remote, and he chucks it right out into the window, into the open ocean. And as for the people on the, um, on the Gotham Citizens Ferry, they encounter a similar moral dilemma. And they take a vote, you know, this is uh, like, like the classic representation of democracy, and the vote says that they should kill the prisoners. But they don't, because simply out of moral dilemma. And this shows that even in both of these cases, we have a clear linearization of justice. For the criminals, they don't have a sense of justice, so obviously they will kill the other people, but they don't. For the Gotham citizens, they have every right to kill the other prisoners. It's the just thing to do. It saves their lives and it punishes criminals. But they don't do it, because justice is not linear. 
And even so, and even the title of the movie in the end ties back to the notion about how justice is complicated. As, Har as Batman takes up the mantle of Harvey Dent's death, he is forced to forfeit his notion of the hero and become the villain in order to save Gotham City. He realizes that justice comes at the expense of truth, and sometimes he has to twist the rules of justice in order to truly protect people. And therefore, the audience, because we empathize with Batman, we complete this character with him. We learn about the complicated nature of justice and how, in the face of chaos, linear justice is not only impossible, but it's also just not, not correct and not real. And uh, again, the Dark Knight presentation is obviously there. As you can see, Heath Ledger's magnetic acting. I mean, just what a man. I mean, just look at that smile right there. I mean, just beautiful. Anyways, the, and also originality. Not before The Dark Knight, there hasn't been a single superhero movie where a psychotic villain is involved. There hasn't been a single superhero movie where we have serious crime issues. In fact, many critics rank The Dark Knight as a crime film and a thriller film more than it is ever a superhero film because it is so much more than just comic book action, although it has some great action sequences. So why should we care about all of this? And specifically, why should we care about no one specifically? I mean, as, as, as I've mentioned before, you know, there are other movies that embed philosophy as well but not the way no one does, and I think his way is precious. That man over there, director Martin Scorsese, he has been nominated for the Academy Awards for eight times, and recently he has released a statement saying that he believes that movies are degrading, that you know, with the advent of huge action blockbusters like the Avengers, all of it, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, we are losing, the, the, the whole of the movie world is losing its substance, you know, it's sacrificing style and visuals over substance, you know, it's becoming more like 2012 and Man of Steel and like those movies that just style over substance. Well, I can tell you, Mr. Scorsese, you are absolutely wrong because we have Christopher Nolan. And Christopher Nolan, and this is the unique thing about him, that the accumulation of all of his originality, uh, presentation, and focus is that he can combine a big action blockbuster and, and real ground substance and make that into an organic and working whole. Um, every, every single one of his movies after Memento is budgeted over $100 million, and yet it has managed to give us both cinematic thrills and philosophical depth, whatever the theme is, whether it's love has no bounds or justice is complicated. And uh, furthermore, he is not done. In 2020, Christopher Nolan will release his, I'm guessing, 12th or 11th film, um, Tenet. And uh, it's a film about time travel, so there's definitely a lot to be speculated. What, what themes will he embed this time? You know, what philosophy will he try to explore, and how will he do so? How will he combine big, big budget special effects with perfect Anglican simple storytelling? You'll have to wait and see the movie to find out. Thank you.